Hey, it's Bonding with Board Games, and it's Hamtag! Hamtag, Game Ooh. Lamper! Ooh, look at that. There's a little deal. We are doing Napoleonic Era. So the Napoleonic right. Sphere. What would that run? Does that run? I know 1815's Waterloo. Uh, water, 1815's Waterloo, and 1801, I think, is when he was crowned emperor. So okay. right I know 1812 there. was right at the Moscow-Russian right. campaign. There is stuff in the 1790s because the field commander right. Napoleon has, right. has oh. scenario boards. He was busy in, in Italy and things. Yep. yep. Okay, good. So we've established that. So... Um, before we get into our top five list, do me a favor out there. If you're watching and you like the show, or you've seen other shows, if you haven't subscribed, I think you click down over there and subscribe. You can also hit the bell. If you hit the bell, it means you're going to get a notification when a new episode comes up. Um, so that helps us and maybe even helps you. Uh, who wants to start with our Napoleonic no, Judd? Okay. Rip it open. He's got well, a coat over his. Uh, i got to pay a little more homage to Greg. Oh, here we go. <laughs> We got another shirt. Yeah, Look at this. Yeah, woo! Actually, right. I happened to have my Hawaiian shirt on today. I was having a Halloween thing at work, and I, okay. I was kind of Thomas Magnum's ugly brother. <laughs> it's my excuse to put it on. Okay, my number five is the Napoleonic Wars. This came out in 2002, the first edition, second edition, 08 by Mark McLaughlin, D GMT. Greg taught this to me, so thank you. And I'll mm -hmm. wear my Hawaiian yep. shirt as an homage for this yep. Um Yes, it is a card-driven game in the, the Mark Kerman system from We the People. Um, it plays up to, I think, four. Is there a It'll four? handle five with Prussia. Yes. As it starts as a neutral. Okay. And um, I think it's the second one that did such a thing. I think Successors was the first. But this was the first exposure I ever had to a card-driven game that went beyond two. So it kind of made a big impression with me. Um, strategic level. Um, this is really the only strategic level Napoleonic game I've liked. I haven't, I don't have that much exposure with them, but the others I played, I didn't care for. This is the only one that hit home with me, so that's really good thing for me on this one. That's why it's here, um, and um, lots of cool stuff in it, like that variable ending part of right. it, um, and. Um, the only thing I would say is when I played this, I was fortunate. Okay, Greg, excellent teacher. We also had Jesse as the French guy, and something I think you told us that kind of stuck with me is you need really good players to be French in England. Greg was England. I was Austrian. Kind of my instructions was don't give in. No matter how much he pounds and you don't give in, I'm like, hey, I'm George Costanza, man. You don't know the amount of spite. I can do this all for the rest of my life, Jerry. <laughs> Seinfeld references. Anyway, um, so, and Greg's back there being like Darth Sidious. Yes, my minions. And he's directing and directing. So you're going being Star sneaky. Wars. Yes. But the the prequels and you're bringing in... Worlds are colliding, Jerry. Of Seinfeld. <laughs> okay. But anyway... So it might be a I tougher game for you and your buddies. <laughs> <laughs> might be kind of a tougher game if you're starting with a bunch of new players and you're all trying to grok it. Um, I think the learning curve is a little steeper. A little steeper. bit of Heinlein. A little yeah. bit of Heinlein thrown in. It's a little... Um, it's a, so anyway, so that's kind of why I've held back on soloing this too much. But I, hey, I, I should get into solo it because if you screw up and cheat, not like my opponent's going to care. Um, so anyway, so that's... Do keep that in mind. As far as the additions, this is first edition. When I saw Greg's second edition went through it, I would highly, highly recommend the second edition. There was an upgrade kit. You're not going to find it. I tried for years. Think about it. People that have it are going to not part with it. They're going to sell their whole first edition with it. I got lucky, found a copy on eBay because the dude didn't know what he had. Um, but so if you're going to get it, snag the second edition. I'd highly recommend that. Um, right. That is my number five. Mm. And I don't know okay. if it'll appear later or if Greg... Greg can tell you a whole lot more about this than I can. Because yeah. you had this in your top five we'll, all time. We'll wait. He'll either have it or he'll yes. chime in. So. All right. In the Bart Brunsheen tradition of heavy gaming... Yeah, there you go. Heavy war gaming, Bart Brunsheen is Stratego Waterloo. Hello. Now, here's the difference with this. Uh, and I don't want to put this up front. I noticed in the video I'm editing right now, it starts to build up and I almost blocked it. Block Greg. All right. Stratego Auto, I think it's 2012, no, 2015. Um, Jason St. Just, which I thought was a very cool designer name. Imagine if you take a Columbia Games block game, dumb it down by half, and pick up regular Stratego eh, just by a smidge. I think that's what you get with this. Now, you do have some, you, you have the standard deal where, um, 
Uh, the English are just trying to hold off until they can get the Prussians in, and there is this nice little count-up turn meter that allows them to start bringing them in as reinforcements, so they got to hold on. Uh, the French generally want to push right away. There is the flat-out Stratego deal where my piece touches your piece. Uh, whose number is higher? The higher one wins. If there's a tie, there's a weird little dice rolling thing, which is okay, a little bit odd. Um, and then there's a possibility of some different scenarios where you can literally lay some different cards down that'll add in a city or or different geographical kind of changes to it and then the other big change to this is rather than trying to find your flag which is typical stratego mm -hmm. um you you each have a card where you pick um a number four sequence on your back line kind of as if it's your escape route or your flank of course, the opponent doesn't know which one of the four that you've chosen on your back line. And if they can end up with two of their pieces in that core area, they're going to win. Um, so you still get that Stratego thing where do you make a real strong area over here and it's pretty obvious or do you try to feint? So okay. the block game feel is kind of what you get because the back of these Stratego, very much Stratego looking pieces, will tell the opponent that's a cavalry unit, that's an infantry unit, that's cannon. Um, and then you do have on your side, you can tell if it's a light infantry or a heavy inf infantry and where their number is going to be, but they obviously have that little fog of war. So it's, it's extremely light. It kind of came and went. Um, I've always been a fan of Stratego. Okay. My number five, I don't own it, but I've played it enough that it made the list, is Command and Colors Napoleonics. Um, I think most of you out there know the Command and Colors system. Part of the reason why I picked this one is because um, the at the tactical level, Napoleonic tactics are so involved with combined arms. I mean, you know, there were combined arms in World War II, there were combined arms in ancient times also, but those combined arms, artillery, cavalry, and infantry, were so prevalent for a long time and I think that Napoleon between his skill and his time really uh, left the mark on that period of combined arms and that's what Command and Colors Napoleonics is about. You know how the infantry work then now I need to do something even though your you know your cards may your hand of cards like in all the Command and Color series may limit what you're able to do right now the correct strategy is to use the artillery this way, to use the infantry that way, and to do the other thing with the cavalry. And um, a theme, when I came up with my list of five games, one thing I noticed is that combat resolution for all of them was different, which I thought was kind of interesting. And in the, this Command and Colors, like the other Command and Colors games, what you've got is customized dice to, to show that infantry got affected or cavalry got affected and things like that. So my number five is Command and Colors Napoleonics. A base game <clears throat> is enough game for me, just like in anything except Advanced Squad Leader. The base game is usually enough to keep me playing. But So that's just French against the British, but there's a lot of expansions out there too. So my number five, Command and Colors Napoleonics. Mm-hmm. Okay, my number four is Waterloo 2009. Martin Wallace is a tree frog. Well, tree frog. You know, it's tree frog or war frog. Um, this is this is kind of my radar. There's a game called Tank on Tank, and it has a cool idea in it that if we were playing, I'm playing Bart. Let's say when I when I start my turn, he draws a chit from a cup with a number on it, two, three, four, five. In this case, for this game. And I start moving. I was like, I'm going to do this guy. That's one action. Two action. Let's say he had drawn a two. And I say, now nah, they're both going to attack. And he holds up that two and says, no soup for you. It's like, Arr! You never know exactly how much you can do. So you're always kind of risking because the more you can bring in, the better. And in the back of it, it said, thanks to Martin Wallace and Waterloo for the inspiration behind that idea. And this was, and when I saw that, I thought, Martin Wallace, isn't he like a Eurogamer type of dude or something? Because I'd played brass and automobile. Come on, you've, you've moved through that by now. Yes. And <laughs> so I went and checked it out and I ended up landing it. And I loved it. And then Bart hooked me on a few acres of snow. And the thing I like about Wallace's games 
is, and I've probably said this before, is I'm not a big Uragamer. I don't hate him, but I'm just not the thing I seek out. But I seek his games out. He's an insta buy for me because his war games have this Euro thing going on in them. He has this little command disc thing that's pretty cool. I'm not going to go into it. And they're always clever and fresh. And, it's, and he says right in there, he's not going for the full sim. I mean, there's only about 100 million Waterloo games out there if you're wanting such a thing. And he's not going to compete with Zucker. He knows that. He goes for balance, and he's looking at something. In this case, it's Fog of War. In Gettysburg, it was the command and control. He always looks at like an aspect and has a clever mechanic. And because of that, they're great fun. So, you know, if you're a real hardcore sim grog on on um, Napoleon, this isn't going to be your game. But if you want to have just to sit down and have a blast playing Waterloo, just like his Gettysburg game for that, it's a lot of fun. Looks really cool. He's got the wood pieces going on in it. Um, and that's what introduced me to him, and I really like his war games. And anyways, that's my number four, hmm. Waterloo. Great art, whoever did that, by the way, too. Oh, by the way, it is out of print. I don't know what it's going to cost. It might cost a little money. So, you, yeah, you might. be my rules. My my advice is always be patient. It will show up in trades if you are patient. All right. Well, we talked about doing the Napoleonic area. It's an area I'm a little weak on, but I had just gotten in um, Bloody Monday, which is from an Italian company. Um, Vinto Nuevo. Anybody? Anybody on the Italian? New wine. Oh, very cool. Emmanuel is the designer, and I can't say his name either, but it's Napoleon at the Gates of Moscow. Block game. Again, this is way more in the line of kind of what you would think of a Columbia uh, game. The map's gorgeous. The big key here, this is 2017 release, and it's Sant'Andrea. Sorry, Emmanuel. The, the big thing here is it is the combined arms, or you got the cavalry, you got your infantry, um, you got your cannon. The um, command blocks are the key in terms of you can move the other blocks that are of your same color, your regiment or battalion, I don't know what the size is. Um, and if there are artillery units that are adjacent, uh, there's some little finer rules, but you can also activate them. And there's even uh, some real nice things with leaders where you have these little uh, yellow inspiration cubes that you can dole out to those that are within your region. And that command influence has a lot to do or has to do with your, if you're Napoleon and you haven't refreshed Napoleon or, or if you've used him and his power starts kind of stepping down as you use him to refresh units, the battlefield starts to shrink and tighten a little bit and it gets a little bit harder on your maneuver. And that is the kind of the big kick in here is how you're going to move in and you're battling over. Um, there's six key spots that the Russians, or is it seven? I think it's seven and the Russians have six of them at the beginning and the French have one. Or it's an instant victory if you can destroy 10 of the other players' cubes with a little caveat in there, the Russians have these Jaegers, um, they have some militia, and I'm blanking on the other name, and they're, Cossacks yeah, the, the Cossacks, the Cossacks. And they're almost more like blocking kind of troops because they do not trigger into that automatic victory. So what you'll see is the Russians throwing them in. I've only played this solitaire kind of against myself with open. I'm working through doing a full review. Um, I'd love to get in there and play this with you just to see how that works. I've just been working on the mechanics and the solo play of it. Um, but uh, very interesting. Um, I've, I haven't messed around a lot of Napoleonic games, and usually they're they're lighter or they're Waterloo, like another one on my list, or it's out at sea. Uh, but I was very interested in the Russian side of the. Uh, so campaign. just looking, looks like this is the Battle of Borodino. Is it just yes. the one scenario? They have another scenario. This is a shorter one, supposed to go in about an hour to hour and a half. They have one called Bloody This Bloody Monday. They have another scenario in there called Last Blood, I think. And it's a more of a three-hour game, and it's it's set up to be. Can't remember. I haven't played that one. I just looked at it as I was thumbing through. Last Blood has got a little bit more in depth in terms of the maneuver and the initial setup. Same map. Same map. Okay. Okay. Borodino. Thank you, Greg. Da. I would have been saying Borodino because uh, that's uh, what I had been hick. saying. I've even got bored. I would have said Bordino directly. Say it for me one more time. Bordino. That's, what, yeah. I that's why I struggle Bordino. with people's names when they're. I speak Kansas <laughs> fluently. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> uh, okay, my number four 
is again one I don't have, but I've played it enough that it's on my list. It's W1815. It's oh. by UNP Games. It's just, uh, I mean, the map's about this big. And the interesting thing about this game, this is the Battle of Waterloo, mm -hmm. but the interesting thing about this game is there is no movement on the map. You set out your various forces. You set out the Grand Battery. You set out the Imperial Guard. You set out uh, Durlan's Corps. And then as those units get activated, you roll a die that says what the effect of that one is. But it's still cavalry can do different things. Infantry can do different things. Our, our artillery can do things against, you know, infantry can form squares but we'll get hit by artillery if they form squares. Mm -hmm. And it, just like every good Waterloo game, you know, it boils down to the British holding on until the, Pr the Prussians can come on. But that uh, that's another part of the dice mechanic because this one, I said everyone had a little different. This one is regular die rolls, just regular D6, but the effect varies depending on what unit you're activate is activated mm. so and this game takes about 15 or 20 minutes you can play i think the first time i did it i did it like four or five times in a row uh eventually figuring out oh this is this is what you're supposed to do um i haven't seen i, I don't think it's in print anywhere anymore mm -hmm. difficult to find mm -hmm. but you know you never can tell so I'm, I'm going to be checking. Um, I'm headed down to the Board Game Geek convention in a couple weeks. They have a, well, they don't call it a flea market. They call it a bazaar, and we can always hope. But my number four game is W1815 by UNP Games. I have spent the last five weeks trying to acquire that game. <laughs> have you played it? No. I just heard so much buzz about it. It's there's there's it's good buzz. Yeah, and that's what yeah. got it on my I just heard when it came out I kept hearing buzz. I thought, you know what, I'm gonna I'll try to trade for it. No, nope, mm -hmm. it's not on pay it forwards. Um, it's hard to find for sale in the marketplace. And if the ham tag effect, as I hear it called, that we drive up prices of games, I better <laughs> snag one before you put this out. Please oh. put the other video up first. <laughs> Okay. Oh, be a free Anyways, number. it's Real not quick. easy, I'll warn yeah. you. So. Real quick, quick question. When you brought right. up um, the uh, combined arms, and, mm -hmm. and in particular in Bloody Monday, the, the use of the artillery or the cannon fire is crucial. And of course, um, the way the commanders are set up, you have much more ability to, and, and even as you fire off your cannons, there's a step decrease in the cannons that I believe is okay. there to show that as the battle is emerging, things start to break down and not work as well as you would have if thought. My guess would be you, you start to run out of ammunition. They've okay. got even less less uh, logistics capability than they do during the Civil War. You know, the pickets, the, the cannonade before Pickett's Charge could go on for a long time, but they had even a, a better way than they did 50 years earlier on how to keep no that makes sense keep our uh, ammunition in place okay yeah because uh and that that's why in this one uh i mean just looking at it, it's real clear that these these jaegers and and cossacks because they don't affect the victory conditions with that auto win of mm -hmm. 10 cubed they they get pushed to the front and as they slow the things down so the russians can hold maybe and that's another napoleonic game wellington's victory uh you know, it's three maps, it's big, it's, I think, either twelve or 1,500 pieces. But a major part of that game, and some people say it's too big, is sending out skirmishers in front of the line to, to absorb those impacts. Hmm. And then what you end up with is hundreds of skirmish counters out in front of you. Hmm. But Interesting. Sorry. Okay. My number three is Napoleon the Waterloo Campaign 1815. Uh, this first came out in 1974 with Gamma 2. Avalon Hill put out a second edition, I think in 74. Columbia put out a third edition in 09, and this is the Kickstarter from 13. I have, I meant to bring the third one and hold them up side by side. I also own the third edition. Yes, you do. And it is good, very good. My friend Rob has the Avalon Hill. Um, I've played second, third, and fourth editions. They're all good games. The second edition has a lot less blocks. 
Um, I call it the Goldilocks game. Second felt like it had too few. Third felt like it almost had too many. And this one felt just right. Bard introduced this one to me right after it came out on Kickstarter. And after I played it, I thought it was just an upgraded components, bigger map, glossy blocks. And after we played it and I saw that feel, I was like, oh, I regret it not backing that Kickstarter. Um, nobody trades that don't even try. I've been working on this one for like two, <laughs> three years. Um, so how did you get your yeah, copy? It was, uh, oh, it's, it's, it's in print. You can buy it. Oh, okay. I thought you can buy it right off Columbia. You buy a it. burglary. Yeah. No, 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 no. Just... You know, I look forward on pay it forwards and trades. No, 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 no. Um, the best, I'll tell you this, the best deal I could find on it was um, Amazon. Uh, Columbia has a page up there. I think it was 72 with free shipping. Otherwise, I think it's going to run you about 75 to 80 at a friendly, like your local game store. And if you buy it online, mm -hmm. you're going to be paying shipping. They don't do deep discounting. So if you found it in an online retailer, it's going to cost now, you. Now, Columbia used to be at BGG all the time. I don't think yeah. they were there last year, though. Maybe uh, they, yeah, were. they missed were. it. Were they? Yeah, okay. Yeah, they, were. they were. So, uh, okay. so that might be a good place. Although this will, yeah, you know, this will air after. Um, but yeah, the um, the game is um, the one thing they added in this that I really that one thing that I really dug was it it doesn't use the ABC combat from Hammer of the Scots. It's much older. It's that three sections, and if one of them breaks, you route them in that battle when you play it. Um, this had a train blocks you play. You draw ran you draw and then put it out there, and it's cool because it gives you that feel like you're seeing the battlefield and you're trying to uh, it's not just who has the numbers it's how you're using the battlefield with your numbers kind of like at gettysburg you figure out the round tops the little round tops the key so i loved that part of it and that's and then like i said the blocks are right the map on the game that's been a complaint in the past is maps too small a lot bigger map so it has just a right About feel percent bigger yeah glossy blocks so it's just a real sharp game so i don't regret it i mean my third edition's fine before I got this, which I got this in the last month, I played it years ago and been trying to get it since. If I, when I had the third edition, it was going to be my number five game. So it's still good. If I would have had the Avalon Hill, it would have been my number five. So it's good. Just this one pushed it up two notches above. Uh, designed by Tom Doglish and according to BGG, some others. I don't know if Tom did the original one and through the years as they've added on, other guys are on board. I thought of this today. I wish I had thought I would have wrote Grant and asked him how it works. Tom is like to block games what Charlie Parker's to Bebop. He's like the godfather of blocks. And um, so anyways... Another. Uh, yeah. <laughs> another, another cross cultural. Okay. But I mean, he is. Is there a Halifax possibly? No. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, he did. Tom did the original one, Quebec, which is kind of like the, the original of the modern block games. Not Stratico, but what you can see rooted in all the current block games. And he did 18, War of 1812. So, you know. Um, uh, East Front's his too, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, anyway, so yeah, he's. You see his name on a block game. It's it's got instant credibility. Um, great game. Nine number uh, three. Let me ask you a question about. You you said you put out the terrain. Is that after you've committed to battle? No, you put them out first. So do you do you get to Wait. do you get to know what the terrain is going to be before? You know, this is the strategic map, tactical map, yes. right? Do you get to see what the terrain is on the strategic map? No, the strategic doesn't play into it. You just move your pieces over here. Then you got this group of blocks. So, but that, but then that means that I might strategically move into an area where the other guy, in a, in a place where if I knew the terrain was there, I would not have attacked him there. You draw three blocks. The defender draws two blind. Attacker draws one, and then you can place them left, center, or right. And I believe it's okay. woods, hill, and Streams. stream. Yeah. So in a stream restricts okay. the movement or the push. Okay. Uh, Hills give you more artillery. So it's I so think. it's limited. Yes. That's, yes. that's yes. the main thing. Yeah. The okay. general idea is you know you're going to be battling this guy okay. here, but then as you round that ridge or crest that hill, you're okay. Like, oh, I've got a creek here, and I've got. Okay. It kind of. I mean, the, it always reminded me of Gettysburg. I forget the guy's name who showed up first with the cavalry and realized that this is a. Great. This is the key place because all these roads go into here. And he saw the train right away and started putting mm. up those skirmishes trying to hold the Confederates until they could get into place. Mm. They saw where it was at and they knew what they wanted. That is the best part of the miniseries of, with Gettysburg or the TV show is when he, he knows that... The uh, movie. The movie, sorry. Yeah, he Sam knows, Elliott. Yes, God. And he's like... Because he knows, and I'm forgetting the main commander that's rolling in. That's uh, the, the guy... He's just taking over The guy Mead. that's coming? Is it Meade? Meade is the main commander, yeah. but who he's really waiting for is Reynolds, the yeah. first first corps. Right. 
but he wor he's worried that Meade's going to be slow and cautious. And he's like, I can see this. And he sees it in reverse with, I know we're in the Civil War, but man, I was, and he's like, I need to do something. Yeah, I just know Civil War better than Sorry. Napoleon. But yeah, that's what it reminds me of when you draw these trains. Like you're here on the battlefield, your troops are pouring in. And like you said, the defender knows it better. They're already there. So they're trying. To, you're trying to set it up to your strengths. Yeah. And it's a nice that it's the blocks are upside down. So you may be hoping like, boy, I sure hope I can, as a defender, I can draw that creek because I would like it over here. And then you set your blocks down. Yes, then you so, flip them. So you're able to, and okay. it's just a nice little little thing. Okay. It's not a game breaker, but it, it will enhance, enhance your combat. Um, so. Yeah, nice feel on that board. Yeah, okay. So my number, boy three. did I mess my stuff up. Yeah, I accidentally put a five in there, isn't that weird? It's a three, and I don't have it here in front of me. Um, Sales of Glory, I was actually sent a uh, like a preview copy of it, and the bling of the final one is just so gorgeous. The, I want to give a nod to the gentleman that's always at the store that has the all of them, the war gamer that Doug? Doug, yes. Doug, I was Doug Southwell. Doug's name. Doug has all the ships in there. He, he backed, I, I think he backed everything he could on yes. the Kickstarter. Yeah, and it, and it just, it, it, I, I realized, well, I won't go it in because it'll spoil things. So, Sails of Glory, what's real nice is it's, it's the wooden ships, Iron Men kind of redone under the um, uh, Wings of Glory type system where your, your sailing vessel uh, sits down, has a lovely miniature that sits down on a little rectangular deal that shows uh, there are angles of fire. So a full broadside, depending on the ship, may be very narrow. It could be a little wider. And then fore and aft. And, it, and so you just use your ruler um, and you determine if it's long range or short range. And then if it's within your broadside or fore or aft. And then there's even special rules for chain shot and grape shot. Um, and you got to be really close for that. It's really nice to get that feel for the visual side of it. And then for movement, your particular ship, um, again, just like Wings of Glory, has cards that are going to allow it to, to move in certain angles. And you're going to have like a little arrow set at your ship, and then you're going to take your ship and you're going to move it to wherever the little other part of that arrow is on your move. And you've got multiple different cards you can play that are they're very close to each other, but some of the ships are faster than the others. So they've got slightly different cards based on the type of ship you have. Um, it's a very enjoyable. It's got a great toy factor. I love uh, the way you can visualize your, your firing arcs and your movement. So Sails of Glory came out 2013. Um, and that's it. I'll flash a photo up here so you can actually see what it is. Okay, my number three is Maneuver by GMT. Uh, this came out in 2008. This is uh, very abstract, but very fun. You've got uh, eight nationalities in here, French, British, uh, Austrians, Prussians, Russians, even the uh, US ends up getting involved in this. Every, <coughs> every, uh, every opponent has their own units it might be a mix it's a mix of artillery cavalry well some of them have artillery attached uh the who is it it's the turks i think have a lot of cavalry involved and then they have a deck of cards that you really only go through the deck one time that lets you activate a unit there's also there's also cards for rebuilding units things like that and it's just a matter of it's played out even on a square map so it's not not played on hexagons uh and it's just how many units you kill in that you know so so it's like a flat non-black non-block version of one of the mm -hmm. command and colors games but it's just it's just fun. I mean, it only takes it doesn't take that long. The terrain comes into play. You know, if you're up on a hill, you'll you'll get the advantages. Um, you know, it's it's nothing. I would not say this is a study on Napoleonic tactics, but it's something that it can be played by gamers of all ages. It's still very popular at WBC. Played you know a lot of people play in the tournament there. Maneuver is my number three. Napoleonic Napoleonic era game 
Just because it's fun. Hmm. Didn't you have that on your best intro games, five best intros? I think I did, yeah. because yeah. I was going to say, it's an excellent intro. I right. think it's about an hour to play. My friend Rob and I played this. He has it, and we've gone through most of it. There's an awful lot of game in there, because all the different countries in there and the way you can mix and match lots of you know Americans versus French you know Italians versus British all the different possibilities you can have in there that's it's an awful lot of game for the money oh sorry it's my turn my number two is Fading Glory uh, 2012 GMT this come from um, Victory Point Games puts out this series Waterloo 20 Jenna 20 they all have 20 counters in them um, this was a joint venture GMT and Victory Point Games. They took four of the games in there. Waterloo's one of them, that place he named, and two others I'm not even going to attempt because I will just embarrass myself. Thank you. I wanted to say Bordino again. Bordino! <laughs> Bordino, Smolensk, and Salamanca. Okay, I would have totally butchered those up pretty bad. Um, it's four of these in there. It's given the GM treat. GM tree, GMT treatment, <laughs> mounted boards, gorgeous counters, great looking cards, and um, they were going to put a second one out, and then I think there's, it was going to take too long to get in the queue, and then by then Victory Point Games was doing their gold banner editions, so they're taking that, and I think they got two or three in them, you'd have to check it out. Um, I have these four, and then I have Jenna 20, so I haven't seen the new ones from GM, I mean from Victory Point Games. They are all great games. Um, it's a, they solo perfectly. They have a deck of cards that create this friction of war. But the really cool part is you have a morale track on there. And the way you lose the game is your morale goes to zero. And you, it's, it's a currency, battlefield currency. If you want a die roll modifier, it's like committing the reserves, you give up a point. If you want a force march, you give up a point. You can re get a point back like during night turn. Sometimes a card will give you one back or cost you another, but it's driving down the whole game and it's how bad do I really want this? If units get routed, you lose points and maybe the other guy picks one up for, it helps his morale. But that is a very cool mechanic to use in the morale as your banking points. They all have it in it. And different, um, this one has, it's mounted maps, double sided. So you got all four maps, four different counters, four different decks of cards. Um, there's a few um, unfortunate errors on it, like map printing errors are set up. It, was, it should have been caught. GMT went through a little span with little quality issues back then. But if you go on Board Game Geek, it's all there, the errata to fix it. So if you get it, I remember I setting up, I go, wait a minute, you know, and so I got on there and it's there. So deal with that and it's great. Excellence, just gorgeous game and it's a blast. Takes about an hour. It's a real good, really great beginner game. That's my number two. Is that also... Is it still 20 counters per 20 side counters. per game? Uh-huh. Okay. Hmm. All right. Well, a little deja vu. So we've got a play in. Uh, Waterloo Campaign, 18 sure you're not doing a magic trick and you just grab <laughs> That's right. Yours is still over there. Um, you know, everything you've said and kind of what we talked about is the key. For me, this was the very first game I played, played with you, that had that tactical map breakdown where, where we're moving on this larger strategic version. Now we're coming in and we're hitting, and now we're trying to hold the line. Mm -hmm. And I really loved how you pulled in and held that line on there. You brought uh, your uh, third edition in. And, uh, you know, we got to play with those green blocks for the first time. I did love that slight little, just like I'm not sure what's over that hill or what's sort of across that ridge feel to it. Um, and then just how the battle played out, then whoop, we're back on the big map again. Mm -hmm. um, it just flowed very nicely. Um, you know, as, we, as I was even first reading the rules, I thought, wow, so I'm here and suddenly I'm yanked out of that and into this what looked to me like a very dull board. Okay, hey, left, center, right, right. right. Yeah, and yeah. I was like, how is that going to be fun? And then we started playing. I was like, oh, this is great. And and so it was it was a, an extremely enjoyable game, and I was I was more than pleasantly surprised. And I and I did really like the when you told me that those green terrain blocks weren't in the other versions, you were like, oh my. And I was like, yeah, yeah this is cool. Um, so that, that's that's uh, my number two, Napoleon. Those train Model blocks. 1850. Those train blocks need to be in more games. Grant, hook, hook us up. The only one I've ever <laughs> seen it in besides this was New York 1776 Washington mm. game, and 
they're a blast. I mean, it doesn't really work with the ABC combo. Maybe, make, make, maybe they can make it work, but it seems to work so well with that three section. You get so tense when you got a couple of weak so, you know, a couple of weak units over here, and you're, or maybe you're weak on this side and he's weak on this side, and if you mm -hmm. can take him to zero, you route him and real bad stuff happens. Mm -hmm. And you're just holding on, begging, please don't roll six, you know, or roll, sorry, this game is one, two, or threes on the smaller, but you, please don't hit. And different units have different hit numbers too. And um, it's very tense in the combat. So two quick things before I go on. Number one, about Napoleon, it's interesting what you said about the technical board because I've, I've got the Avalon Hill version, mm -hmm. and uh, the thing that I liked about the game was the the strategic board trying to figure out, you know, you've got Napoleon, do I do I go over here and go right after the Prussians, do I go over here, do I try, to, do I risk, you know, moving down the middle where they, where they, the, the tactical board is fun to play, but that, but the strategic board is when I really figured out. Oh, this is what Waterloo is about. Mm -hmm. You know, is is about deciding. You know, how can I, how can I, take care of these guys before these guys get here. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I wanted to say, I forgot to mention it. I, I mentioned that combat in all of these games is different. The combat and maneuver is each. The different kinds of units use different sided dice. This this oh, yeah. this some. This one might use a D6. This that one might use a D8. This one might use a D10. Hmm. That gives it, you know, artillery might use a D10, and light infantry might use a D6. Hmm. So that's that's how that does different pieces of combat. Um, one thing I was going to freestyle. Sure. Avalon Hill's tactical board is different. It's more complicated. But in a lot of ways, I like it better. I really wish on the on this edition they would have had it as an option where you could play it. But they've been on this system for What's so long. Because I know this is a reserve in the back you can have. I remember like right. when you wanted to charge with cavalry. It's been a while since I played Avalon Hill. I want to say like you move them to the middle. And do you remember? You know it better and, than well, I do. It's, it, what I remember is the like the front had uh, advancing and then attacking. Uh -huh. So, you know, you can advance, whereas cavalry has enough speed where they can do them both. Yes, they had two movements, yeah. Right. It was it was a different, it was very cool, It w but yeah, I like, they both had their strengths, and you know, I wish I could kind of have it all where it could all be fused, but it is more, uh, it is more complicated, not as complicated game, but this is easier. And it was, well, fewer blocks. Yes, a lot fewer. Fewer blocks, but more things going on in the tactical map. Yeah, yeah the, so the Avalon the Hill almost felt like they were kind of brittle, like you could break easily. And then the third edition had a lot, so it felt like you could absorb them. And then this one come along and it felt just right, like I don't have units to soak and I don't have units that are quite brittle. It just had a just right feel to it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so my number two, now we're talking big stuff, now we're talking more complicated stuff. This is Napoleon Tri Napoleon's Triumph by Simmons Games. It's the second one. First one was on the Battle of Marengo, and this fixed a few things. Not that some of the some of the road movement in the Marengo game was a little funky. It, it needed a little more tracking. But this one is the Battle of Austerlitz, and this is a big. This is this fits on my 48 by 36 table. This is fog of war blocks, but the map and the blocks look like. The, the maps that you'd see in the, if you've seen the copies of the, like the West Point Atlas of American mm -hmm. Wars, you know, you, you've got the red and the blue, and uh, this one, the movement on it is really, uh, it doesn't look like it, but it's really pretty un easy to understand because units, the map is broken up into geometric areas, and then in an area when you've got units there, they have to either be in reserve in the middle or blocking the approach. And then depending on whether you're in the blocking the approach or in reserve, you have limited movement options. The combat is more complex, but there are there are some good uh, flow sheets that are out there on Board Game Geek that explain how it works. So, you know, it's 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 harder to understand, but it's very strictly sequenced. Um, and the the thing about and 
So this is big, you, know, you can play it in multiplayer. I know, again, a lot of times down at uh, the BGG Con, they, they will set up several multiplayer games. If you're running this core, you're running that core. Uh, and the combat system in this one is diceless. You, you, you're looking, you're seeing uh, what units are attacking, how strong they are, what kind of terrain they're attacking into or out of. Uh, is it a feint? A cavalry feint around the flank so you can pull some units out you know those those kind of things are in there so this is my number two big game napoleon napoleon's triumph by simmons games my number two hmm. and it's out of print it will cost you a ton of money not that i've tried but i know a lot of guys <laughs> it's heavy tried. that you're is like a big heavy feet. game yep as if, far as heft you, you're going to spend three figures and the really? first one might have a two on front of it Whew. yeah Okay, my number one is Command and Colors Napoleonics. Um, Greg mentioned the combined arms. The way that works is if you're familiar with Borg's system, if two different units attack, first guy rolls his dice, do whatever, next guy will roll his dice. If you have artillery, and, and if the infantry can only attack, or if they're adjacent, you roll all the dice together and they hit on the sabers, that, which the artillery normally would not. So you get a lot of dice and a lot of damage. Um, if you're familiar with Borg's system, he, I like what he does, how he takes, it amazes me how he can take one system and like all the cart this piece and this piece and this mm -hmm. piece and make a game. But he always seems to throw a twist in them that really works well for what he's going. This one has the square. And the way it works is if you charge me with the cavalry and I form up in a square, I hold my cards out and you draw one of them. I don't get to see what it is. And we put it down there on the, in the market, square one and then square. And I'm playing shorthanded as long as I'm in the square. I can't come out of it as long as that cavalry is adjacent. Cal cavalry. I always call cavalry. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I can't pronounce anything related to Napoleon. Okay. Um, anyways, um, I can't come out of it while I'm there, and then it's going to cost an action to come out of it. But you play shorthanded, and if you get a lot of these guys or more than you know, a couple of them, you are really hurt because this is a game you don't want to play shorthanded because you can't activate the left, and you need lots of cards to up your chance of getting something. So anyways, that is very cool. And lots of unit differentiation. If you're familiar with Ancients, this has a two riflemen, different types of artilleries, different, you know, uh, the grenadiers type of guys. Um, so it has a lots of units. So it's using the blocks instead of you no know, plastic in this. Um, very, I mean, it's more complicated as compared to memoir. It's more like the ancient style. A lot of people think this is the best. The really, one of the really cool things that struck with people that doesn't happen in his other games, as you lose units, you lose dice. You know, memoir, no matter one, two, three, or four, you're rolling three dice. This one, it tells you how many dice, and there's charts for it, but as you lose units, you lose dice. Mm. Um, so yeah, that worked out pretty cool on this. This is a lot of people's favorites. I'm a little more, I, I prefer the ancients. Um, the theme hits a little more for me. Napoleon's not a big of a thing with me, but I get why people love it, and I love it too. I have all the, uh, not all the expansions, I have all the armies. I don't have the epic one where you play multiple maps and the generals, but I have the Austrian, Prussian, Russian, Spanish armies. Haven't got into them yet, though. Anyways, that's my number one command and colors, Napoleonic. So, two things I want to ask. Number one, do you need, do you feel that you need the expansions or is there enough game in the basic? There's enough game. Okay. Um, here's the thing with me. I've mentioned this before. I, I got interested in the Civil War from Battle Cry. It was like a gateway to the whole topic. Ancients, mm -hmm. I knew nothing about it. My friend Rob starts teaching me about it, we, and now I just love Ancients. So I thought, hey, this is a great way to learn about Napoleonic. He tells you a little about the battles that go on, mm -hmm. and I thought, right. this will whet my appetite. And I knew just from playing um, the Napoleonic Wars, all these other countries are involved. So I thought, hey, you know, he has all these scenarios, all these battles I knew next to nothing about. Um, I mean, the only thing I've ever, I watched a documentary on the History Channel um, off of YouTube, and Sean Chick, G-I-T-T-E-S, his username, makes a geek list on Napoleon. It's must, it's excellent read. But that's all I knew about him. So I thought this is a great way to get into it as I start working through all these scenarios. Well, and that's the neat thing about the system is the way you can add in these very specialized units that are usually abstracted out. But here, or memoir, or ancients, you know, you've got, you know, an, an elephant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and this is what's going to, and this is how he's going to, to do his elephant thing. 
And so I would imagine you've got, you've probably got your, um, oh, it was the uh, the sharpshooters that would also kind of go out as pickets. And I know that's not what they the British, called. The British yeah. rifle. Yeah, they get yeah. like they get like five or six yeah. dice. They and get they roll more than everybody else if they're if they're do, not in melee because they used rifled rifles. The so um, now, what was interesting was I wrote Borg years ago and asked him if he if he ever considered making an American Revolution expansion because I figured, what, there's maybe 16 scenarios tops in the, that you'd have for this, for the American Revolution. It would, hey, close time period. And he's he always has his, shh, I know nothing, and uh, attitude towards everything. It means he was working on something. And I bugged him about Memoir 50, the Korean War. I know nothing, so maybe we'll get lucky. Anyways, he didn't. He made it another game. And I thought, ah, dude knows how to make money. He's like um, Garfield, knows how to make money off this system. But no, he... He tailors them. That one was very much about routing units and low casualties, so the flags are a big deal. I'm not going to go into that game. But he took a game, and it plays completely differently while using a similar system. And that's why mm -hmm. I always tip my hat to him, that he always knows how to make customize these things. Hmm. See, and the, the other thing I was going to say about that is the way you were describing the squares and the uh, the cavalry being adjacent, have you, have you ever... 1970... Sergei Bondarchuk did a, a six-hour version of War and Peace that has that battle in there. And, you know, it, that's one of the ones, I mean, thousands of extras. And he shows the, the, the British units forming squares and the French cavalry attacking him and swarming around him and everything. And mm. I, when you gave that description, that was a scene that went through mm. my head. So, mm. Okay, so my number one, it's interesting. That was my five, year one. My one is similar to year five. This is Wellington, the Peninsular War. This is, again, Mark McLaughlin. It is the same basic system as Napoleonic Wars. But this one just focuses on the war in Spain. It's a, up to a four-player game. You've got the British Army, the Spanish Army and uh, militia running around the countryside. And then you've got the French forces broken into the ones that were active down south uh, around, well, I'll say south, Barcelona, uh, Gibraltar, Cadiz, and the ones that were operating further north. Uh, the difference between this and Napoleonic Wars is this doesn't have any influence in, and there's no political uh, part to it. The, the It's just about the fighting. And there's also very little, you know, Napoleonic Wars, there's a lot of uh, naval action that takes place. Here it's very, very limited. It just comes from a few cards that can come into play. Um, and then, so what you're doing historically, the French are trying to hold on to Madrid at the beginning of the game, then, you know, they get pushed back. So they're trying to hold the mountain, the river passes, the mountain range, and then on the end of the game, they're trying to actually keep the British and Spanish from getting too far into France. And like in most, coin, well, in most of these games, you've got the two French, they have to win the war, but then one of those two will win the game, depending on how well they do. Mm. Um, so this is this is my number one. This is the one I, I play the most. And we talked about Napoleonic Wars. There is a third one in the series called Kutuzov. Yeah. That is about the 1812 uh, Napoleon's invasion of Russia. The reason why I picked this one, again, it's kind of a Goldilocks thing. Kutuzov, I found, not that I've played it a lot, but I found that it, it was designed too much about the historical result. You, it, there were many uh, mechanics in the system that were designed to push Napoleon to do just a straight push through to Moscow, and then he has to, to get clobbered on his way back out of Moscow. Hmm. And you can break the game. I think you can break the game if you don't do that. Hmm. On the other hand, Napoleonic Wars, is, especially in the political arena, 
allows too much freedom. You know, Prussia can do whatever they decide they want to do this turn, and then next turn they can do something different. And uh, so for that reason, uh, that's why it's not my number one. Even though I played a lot, mm -hmm. um, I played, and when I go to the World Board Gaming Championships, and I always play it, I usually play in the tournament, I always play it ahead of time because one of my regular uh, partners does play every year, so we sharpen him up by playing the game before we go to the World Board Gaming Championships. And to go on with, the to say again what Jed said, a problem with Napoleonic Wars is really all of the sides are hard to play. Hmm. France controls the tempo for the whole game, so you have to know what you're doing there. Britain has to realize I'm, I'm basically the bank for these guys, and I can only do, you know, you've, you've got your army, which of course, if you're playing a war game, you want to use, but you can't be too free with it because it's, it's too difficult to build and get it back into play. The Austrians are punching bags. That's why, we, you know, like he said, don't give up, don't give up, but that's what's going to happen. So it's difficult to put a newbie in that position unless you're really ready to, unless you know enough how to help him. Russia is so far away that they'll feel like, well, it doesn't matter whether I'm, I'm involved or not. I'll just stay back and I'll try to do things with Turkey. And Prussia is just a wild card. Hmm. So, so that freewheeling is a fun game if everybody knows it, but I think this is, this is a better game for people that know how to play it. Mm -hmm. You know, all four players know what, what's going on. So this is my number one Napoleonic game, Wellington, the Peninsular War. I had a few questions. Mm -hmm. I was going to comment on something else. Sure. I've heard a lot of people say, mm -hmm. the, the Napoleon enthusiasts, that Napoleonic Wars is pretty poor history, and I, I don't know enough about it to judge. I played Age of Napoleon. I got it and played with my friend Rob, and we both played. And it's Consider a pretty good game by a lot of folks, kind of card driven in nature. And we both kind of said, This is lame. But a lot of people love it. And I told him, I said, Man, it just felt like I was playing a whack a mole. Mm. And he said, well, That's kind of how the Napoleonic Wars was. And I said, I'm not a really strategic Napoleonics guy. That's why I didn't have much. <laughs> but um, so I don't know if it's good history. But when you said that, I was like, Wow. Yes. But the questions I had was, um, is that game is dependent on like where you have to have you're not going to put a newbie in charge of France or screw your game up is this one where no because in this one you uh, I don't think that because in this one uh, like I mentioned the two French players have to have to win the war so you know in in that game you know uh, France could let Austria get pummeled because they're thinking oh I'm going to invade through Brest and I'm going to get into Paris so I don't care if if the French get decoyed over there whereas in in Wellington they have to work together you know you you hold the southern pass I'll hold the the northern pass and we'll be able to intercept into the to the center same thing the British and the Spanish have to work together uh, like one of the things the as you're moving through France you're placing a flag to control the area. The British, you know, they've got Wellington, they've got a big force, but they can flip it for either themselves or for Spain. And many of the spaces don't matter for victory. So you flip it for Spain so that he can build units there. Mm. So you end up, you're, unless both members of the team don't know what's going on, you, you're, the game is designed so the two players have to work together. Okay. Does it? Does foreign wars come into that? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, well, there's a, yeah, there's a few things like I know, but m only in the sense that they affect the uh, reinforcement rate. Okay. Hmm. And my number one, which I didn't throw in, was wooden ships and iron men. Oh, I talked a I skipped game to you. That was all right. That was all right. <laughs> I kind of started commenting on command and colors, and it just kind of whoop. Yeah. Um, but. Uh, in naval, in our uh, naval war games, it was my number one. A lot of this is one. What you said, I haven't played a real 
depth of Napoleonic War games. And two, uh, the game I played the most of on this list is Wooden Ships and Iron Men. I got it young, I was huge into Ratio Hornblower, and I was working on a cruise ship on the East Coast, and I, I, I picked it up in Maine, and I played, and I played, and played, and, uh, and it's in a box somewhere because it's a huge, skinny, flat box. So, but uh, I'll throw up a photo of that. And that's Hamtag. Um, Hamtag! Question real quick. Sure. Have any of you guys played a Kevin Zucker game? Yes. Okay, because oh I hear God. his name kind of tossed around as one of the, you know, the dudes on Nepal. And I tried to get one to pay it for, and it didn't work. And I was, I was kind of hoping to, and I was just wondering if any of us is going to have one, because I hear so many people talk about how good his games are. Hmm. I have played, um, I'll, and I'll admit it, all I have played are the small ones, uh, Battle for Italy and 100 Days Battle. I have Napoleon at Bay and Struggle of Nations. Uh, the, the, which of that system, I really don't know whether Kevin Zucker designed all of those. I don't know if he did Struggle in Nations. I assume he did. Okay. Because that was a while back. Hmm. Um, and again, uh, so now Napoleon at bay, because I got my new bigger game table, I can now get that on the table. So I'm going to, I'm, that's what I'm hoping to get in. Okay. Put, yeah. put them in the comments if you all played them and what your top fives are. Good one. Yeah, I think they're they're supposed to be the uh, the operational combat series of Napoleonic times. Mm. Okay. Yeah. And subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Helps us out a lot. And if you're on BGG, give it a thumb. Yeah, thumb it up. It'll. Here's the here's part of the goal on the bigger. We've gone long, but I I really. Um, you know, we feature war games, and we're one of the, I think we're the only kind of top five group. I don't know. Top I, don't, group. I don't know if, you know, thanks. Yeah, I, I, I well, see Tom enough other there, things yeah. that, no, but I think I think I see <laughs> enough other things that people talk about that there are uh, that there are others out there. Okay. Well, maybe I haven't seen them. Okay. All right, cool. But subscribe either way. Because. Well, we can get these up. Right. So, I think the more people, I keep seeing stuff where people are like, wow, I've never even heard of game x which judd mentioned or wow greg's got me buying two games that i didn't even they weren't on my radar now they are and then like small children want to get waterloo stratego <laughs> there you go all right we're out of here have tag have tag see ya <laughs>